Hi, Jeff Lawton here, and I'm back at my home in Zaytuna Farm, Northern New South Wales, Australia. And today I'm answering questions in the second of a series of Q and A's. Today, the questions are, what are the priorities for starting a permaculture food garden? And number two, how do you go about gardening in exceptionally wet climates? Okay, let's get started. Okay, our first question comes from Scott and he asks, what should we prioritize in a permaculture food garden that is relatively small? I'm talking for people who live on a quarter acre block or less. Okay, no matter what the scale, we're going to have to prioritize aspect. Are we getting six hours of sunlight? Because that's exactly what you need or more. Then on contour, we've got to prioritize contour because with contour, we can catch water and we can let it go. We've got both choices. We can appropriately size the garden. So the footpaths are a convenient size, but also the garden beds are no larger than double reach because compaction is our enemy. Those are absolute priorities, no matter how small. Now, what if you're just a container garden and, and you're that small that you're on a veranda or you're on a, a hard surface and you've just got containers? Well, space is really important now and it's, it's precious. So you might go to extremely small footpaths in that case, and, and you're minimizing your footpath in every single way when you get that small, and you've gone down to containers where you want more than 90% of the area in growing space. So you've got inconvenient footpaths, but you've got the system producing. Apart from those essentials, let me give you the top six. Let's do a countdown. Right. Number six, control your edges and the ends. If you design and control the edges, design first and then apply control measures to your edges, the area is easy. So if you, if you have the edges in control, you're probably going to find it very easy to have the garden in control. Don't mind my little fluffy domestic predator here. He does a great job. So, I use strawberries a lot. They're productive, they put out runners, you can transplant them. You've got to move them every two years, otherwise it's pretty hard organically to control a fungus in the ground, but they shift. Then I replace strawberries with other ground covers, like Brahmi, one of the great herbs of the world. Here, Brahmi. It's nasturtium even works really well. Pennyroyal is a fantastic ground cover edge plant, and it gives off a great smell. If it creeps onto the footpath, then when you walk on it, it smells kind of like the dentist. Um, it's kind of a minty smell, but that's one of those smells that deter pests. So there are many selections of small, low ground cover edge plants and end controllers. Now, I often put a perennial on the end. So in this climate, I've got perennial spinach, like Brazil spinach and Suriname spinach. They're permanent, you permanently pick them. You don't disturb the ends much that way, it becomes stable and the edges are in control. Now the area is easy. Number five, mix your annuals and perennials together. Sure, you can put carrots in blocks and then switch to potatoes or peas or onions. Mix those little blocks together and keep switching them around as your annuals but then mix in perennials. Here we have a crop of garlic and I've got asparagus, a perennial. I've got a papaya, a perennial. I've got a cassava, a perennial. Fine, mix them around. We might switch garlic here to a crop of carrots with a crop of onions and different blocks of perennial shifting through it, mixing that diversity together with the stability of perennials and the moving endless cycles of annuals gives you not just stability, but it gives you that extra diversity. Number four, diversity. And diversity in shape and form and color. Here we have kale, but look at the difference in the different types of kale between this leaf and the red purpley leaf. 
completely different shapes, completely different form, completely different color, just in kale. Now you can do that right through your crop regime. Confuse the pests and favor the predators and you're gonna have a lot more success. So right through the garden, include some flowers for color, include some plants for smell. Once you do this, you don't really have a pest problem, you have a design problem. You haven't designed the diversity enough. Okay, number three, take advantage of microclimate planning in design. Plan to extend your season plan to extend your diversity of crop. A lot of climates, you're looking for a sun trap, somewhere a little bit warmer, somewhere that traps the sun and gains heat on diversity. Or you might be looking for reflection to actually increase the harvesting of a fruit. Or in our case, it's shade. We have a hot, humid climate. Here in summer, it's really hard to grow lettuces. They just bolt to seed or fine leaf crop. But Behind me is a banana shade swale that shades this bed. In summer, this is my lettuce growing bed. Designed microclimate, huge advantage. Number two, vertical space. Don't forget the vertical space. You can increase your yield enormously with the surface area of vertical space. Here I have a poly arc. It's actually irrigation pipe covered with fencing mesh. And I've got choco, passion fruit, grapevine, and climbing yam just re-emerging in the springtime here. There's multiple crop over one trellis. It's also a microclimate, it's also shade. It can make a desert garden so much more friendly. But any garden midsummer, it's gonna give you that extra shade, give you that extra production. You can go up the side of a wall, you can use a spally of fruit trees up against a fence or a wall of a house. You can do all sorts of extra crop. You can increase the production by one third by taking up the vertical space and design it by layer on layer on layer, not just one crop, multiple crops on top of each other work absolutely fine. Vertical space, that's a classic advantage. Number one, nutrient cycling. Nutrient cycling of surplus in this spatial relationship where diversity rules. Compost is diverse in the organisms. It's an inoculum of beneficial organisms back to the garden through waste product. The waste product from the garden, from the house, from surplus waste in our area. We easily achieve the components which are low grade and they come out as incredibly high quality life diversity that goes back and gives us that wealth through the health created in the food. We're building soil quality and quantity all the time. Now, on to our second question, and it is, you have explained how to garden in arid regions by using swales and water retention techniques. But what do you do to create permaculture gardens in landscapes which have an abundance of water or even too much water? For example, what about the mountainous west coast of Ireland where the land is very wet? Well, where you don't have high temperatures, you don't get much evaporation. And it doesn't take much rain before you get soils that are waterlogged. So, Water is a very valuable component. You've got to have water involved in growing systems, but you've also got to have air. It can't be airless. So you've got aerobic soils, which have air, and anaerobic soils, which are waterlogged. So you want the water draining through. Now you might not have to retain so much water, but you want higher raised beds. You want the water to be draining through and the air to be going with it because water and air together gives you the ideal growing medium. So the water needs to be draining and the air needs to be moving through the soil at the same time, which means raised beds or even mounds. Mounds are much easier to create than swales because they can more or less be any shape, but they are very well drained. But if you have a dry period, you want to be able to retain some moisture at times. You want the option. Now, 
contour is easier to work. Levels are much easier to move through. They're much easier to push weight in a wheelbarrow. They're much more easier to work around. You can have contour raised beds without closed ends on the footpath. So they will drain, but you have the option to close them off if you do happen to get a midsummer or end of summer drought. You can also have the option of including rock in a kind of semi-retaining wall front edge here, or even rock in the bed, because the thermal mass of rock, not only does it make it well drained, but the thermal mass helps dry the soil, helps reduce the amount of water. As we do in, in herb spirals, where you get a herb spiral, it's really an earth mound spiraled in a rock retaining wall that helps the soil drain. Because a lot of our herbs that we use, in the Western world anyway, are Mediterranean in their origin. So they're very dry, hot summers with wet winters. So they don't like the really waterlogged soil. They don't like any kind of waterlogging. They like well-drained. So the rock in the mound, the spiral retaining wall in the rock of, of rock in a mound of soil helps it drain. The same works when you're in a raised bed garden situation. Everything else is the same. Of course you need compost, of course you need diversity, of course you need combinations of colors, shape, size, pattern. All the thi everything else is the same, except you increase the amount of drainage. That doesn't stop you going on contour. Because contour is always the more convenient way to actually work a garden and any water that sits on contour and runs off is running off passively. You don't want steep slopes running off. You don't want to go up and down the hill because as soon as water's moving quickly, it's taking your nutrient with you and often some of your soil and you've worked pretty hard to keep your soil in place and improving. Keep it on contour, retain your nutrient, work with all the other systems, but aim your design to drainage. In other words, really raised mounds on contour that allow the water to move through with the air and you'll get exactly the same result. It's as simple as that because everything else are life cycles and life cycles the same way everywhere on the planet. Next week, I'm going to be answering questions on the ethics of permaculture. Permaculture is a design science based in ethics. And there are three ethics. And to summarize them, it is first, earth care. Care of the earth, its living and non-living systems. Two, care of people. Making life better for people and improving their lives. And three, the return of surplus. Returning anything that's in surplus back to earth care and people care Ask any question you like about those three ethics. Now, leave a comment down below in this video in relation to your questions. If you, if you look through the comments below and you see a question that you like, upvote it. The questions with the most upvotes are the ones I'll answer next week. If you want to see more information, head over to our websites where we have hundreds of videos and animations and PDFs, all free for you to look at and download and learn about permaculture. If you want to follow me on my social media accounts, I'm on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. And remember, enjoy the journey.